Good morning, Wells Branch Community Church. Uh, thank you, Chris. My name is James Meyer, uh, and as was mentioned, I'm the missionary from the church. Uh, my wife and I, Didi, live in Tanzania, East Africa. We've been there for two and a half years, and we're excited to come home to spend some time reconnecting with the church, preaching, uh, and then head back over. Days like today are exciting for me because uh, I feel I can pretty much say whatever I want, and if they get mad at me, Chris and the elders, the worst they can do is ship me back to Africa, which I'm doing anyways. And so today is going to be a lot of fun for me and you, maybe not for them, but I'm excited. Um, when missionaries come home, kind of what they expect us to do is to talk about where we are and what we've been doing. So I'm going to do just that. Uh, this is myself and my wife and Moses, my oldest son. This was our family vehicle for our first year in Africa. And so this is what we rode all over through the villages, uh, three and four hour road trips on a motorcycle on dirt roads, working in, in the areas of uh, East Africa, Tanzania. This is where Tanzania is located, uh, on the eastern coast, a little bit south. We work amongst a tribe called the Zoramo tribe. We chose this tribe because there's over one million people and essentially no Christians, no churches, no Bibles, there never has been. And so our goal here at Wells Branch Community Church was to choose an area, a people group, a country, where the Bible doesn't exist. Not that there are unsafe people, that there is no existence of the gospel. To say we're going to pour everything we can into this area to bring the life change reality of Jesus Christ to some place it's never been. This is why we chose this area. Show a few pictures of our, our life there. This is our house about the first year. I went over uh, before my wife with Trevor Batten and Robert Spivey, my little brother, and we built this house out of bags of clay, out in the middle of the field, no electricity, no plumbing, no cell phone service, and it gave us a chance to experience the culture. Uh, this was our outdoor shower. I thought it was great showering in the open. My wife didn't. I don't know why. <laughs> I don't really understand. Uh, but this is kind of our life for the first while. This is our normal diet. Now, I show this picture to people, and they always make comments like, that's amazing. I basically eat only rice and beans. No, you don't. So when people tell me that, I, I issue what I call the rice and beans challenge. If you basically only eat rice and beans, and for one week, buy a bag of rice, buy a bag of beans, don't use seasoning, we don't do seasoning in Africa, and eat only rice and beans. About day three, you're going to revoke your claim that you only eat only rice and beans. But this is our life. Uh, this is a normal meal over there. Less beans, but that's, that was my place. We had a lot of beans. Normal life, we have a gym there that we work out in, out in the village. A viper fell out of the roof, and so we uh, smashed his head with a dumbbell. <laughs> These are our two pastors. The way we do missions at Wells Branch is a little different. The reason we did our own thing and started our own missions program was because normally missions goes, and I'm the pastor. I preach to the people, and I lead the people to Christ, and it's all on me. But then someday when I leave and go home, it all stops. We chose to use a different method. We have two pastors. Pastor Lee is on the left. Pastor Jacob is on the right. They both have masters from college, from American universities. But they went home to reach their own people. We spent time praying and found these two men. Everything we do, everything you read on Facebook and Instagram that we do comes from these two men. and soon to be multiplied to five men. All of our ministry runs through the local pastors. Our, our mantra is we plant self-sustaining indigenous church planting movements. So these are our two pastors. Everything we do... They're the force behind it. And so the people come to Christ through their own men. This church you see building, again, we don't build churches for the locals. That gives them the reliance on us. We uh, bought Pastor Jacob about a, a couple hundred dollars of watermelon seeds and rent him, rented him a water pump. And they grew a watermelon crop themselves and harvested it and built their own church. This keeps with our model that our goal is not to come and do missions work for them. We want to come in and find the local people who want to reach their own and equip them to do so. We go through some of the ministries that our pastors have done over there. This is my favorite, our local gyms. Uh, we went through and built a lot of local equipment, me and some of the local um, mechanics, different guys, we got different parts. In Muslim villages, as you can imagine, they're not really excited when you send a Christian pastor in to share the gospel. They won't have those conversations. But when we build a gym, we get 30 to 50 or more young Muslim men that come out to pump weights every night. And our pastors stand there and evangelize. Now, they don't want to hear it. But they're not going to leave when they're lifting weights. And so this has been a very effective way to bridge the gap of sharing the gospel. We also started digging wells with our same model. We're not here to dig wells for you, but we found a technology 
where we can dig wells by hand. And so we teach the local people to dig water for themselves. This has opened up a lot of doors for the gospel. Villages that say, why would we let you come here and start a church? Would you provide clean water in places that it doesn't exist? It opens the door for our pastors to share the gospel. On top of that, we have a 50-acre farm we've been working on. We do two to three crops a year. The goal in this is to give our local pastors and local leaders full sustainability. So instead of looking to America to say, who's going to pay my bills someday when my family moves home, they'll have a farm they will work, and it will create real income. This soon will have Africans reaching Africans, funded by the work of Africans, a complete model. This is kind of what we do here at Wells Branch, how we do missions. We currently are in Tanzania. We're going to be in Peru in the next number of years to branch out. After church today, everybody needs to come so you don't get an excuse. Outside, we have the hospitality room. We're going to have free lunch. A, a television station shot a 30-minute documentary of everything we're doing over there. It's kind of like Duck Dynasty missionary version. So you need to be there. And so right outside, immediately after service, just walk out. We've got free lunch. We get to watch uh, a documentary on, on what's happened in Africa, what Wells Branch is doing overseas, but also how we're going to branch out um, to Peru. And, and kind of you get a chance to ask questions about everything we're doing. Now, this is all fun. You see these pictures. It seems exciting. But Tanzania is not an easy place to live. This is where the local women and men and children get their water. Now, people will tell me, well, it's no problem, just boil it. Let me give you a little science lesson today. You can boil the bacteria out of it, you can't boil the mud out of it. And that's what they drink. That's what their babies drink. That's what you shower with if it's really worth their trouble. This is where you live. Tanzania has 60 million people. America has 300 million, has 60 million people and less than the size of Texas. 50 to 55 million live in mud huts. To say there's no hope is an understatement. There's no clean water. There's no living conditions. There's no jobs. Imagine having a baby there, knowing that before that baby is one years old, there's a 33% chance it'll die. The culture itself doesn't name a baby until it's over a month old. Why? Why name something that's going to die? This is the culture. They've accepted it as the norm. There's no denial amongst themselves. This is reality. There's no hope. Imagine raising a family knowing the day your daughter gets malaria, or your son gets malaria, which they will, they're probably going to die. They can't afford a $1 pill to solve that problem. HIV, rampant. Rape, rampant. No punishment. This is why we chose Tanzania. We identified a country that had no hope. And to top it all off, there's no Jesus, there's no churches, there's no Bibles. They've never heard the gospel. This is what drove Wells Branch Community Church, little, little church, to go overseas and say, we have to make a difference. We can't wait. Other churches wait till they have thousands of people. Wells Branch did it immediately. But I'm not that person that's going to tell you, you know, it's so much worse in Africa than it is here. Life is difficult overseas. Suck it up. Your life is Okay. That's not always true. Kind of an overarching theme for our sermon today is going to be this phrase. It's always winter and never Christmas. Some of you have seen the movie, uh, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. Um, C.S. Lewis, The Chronicles of Narnia. If you haven't, I'm going to try to help you out. Or else you're completely lost right now. Um, a scene during the movie, there's Mrs. Beaver and Mr. Beaver. And Mrs. Beaver comes to him and she's whispering, she's scared. And she says, it's always winter, but it's never Christmas. She's talking about the, the evil witch who has a curse and how it's always harsh conditions and they're never safe. And this phrase, winter, is synonymous with no hope, no future. There's nothing to look forward to. And Christmas is synonymous with the opposite, hope. We have something we strive for. So all this phrase means is there's, we live in a time where there's no hope. We see nothing positive coming. Christmas is never coming. Now some of you think it's winter today outside. It's not. If you think this is cold, you're wrong. Um, I grew up way up north in Minnesota where it would be negative 50. People think it's a joke. It's not. It gets to be negative 50. Snow drifts over the back of your house. And so I've experienced winter. Most of you haven't. The idea is in the middle of that winter, you're so depressed, you think, is it ever going to end? And the idea of it's never ending. 
It's cold. It's miserable. Where's the hope? It's kind of what we're looking at today. But like I said, I, I'm not claiming that we don't experience this here. I'm not that guy telling you life's always great here. Some of you are here today and you think about your marriage and you go, there's no hope. It's been years of back and forth, going to counseling. She never listens. He never listens. Will they never understand? It's been winter for a long time. Where's the hope? Maybe some of you are in school and you're thinking, I can't pass this class. The teacher won't listen. When's it going to end? That's reality. You don't need to downplay that because people have it worse other places. That's reality for our lives. Some of you are University of Texas fans. It's always winter and never Christmas. <laughs> you thought football season's over. Our basketball team will win. Your basketball team's terrible. It's all, so we all identify here. But the great part about God's word is it's not an archaic old book that doesn't identify with us, that doesn't speak to us, but rather God's desire, his heart when the Bible was written was that we could read it and it would speak to us. We could understand that God cares for our needs. Today we're going to be in the, chapter, in the, in the book of Luke. But first we're going to look at um, the book of Malachi. Kind of set it up going into the book of Luke. This is the very last book before Matthew. Uh, if you don't have a Bible here today, if you raise your hand, we have ushers that will bring you a Bible. Um, if you don't have a Bible at all, this is our gift to you. You can keep it. If you do have a Bible, just leave it on your seat when it's over. And they'll pick that up. Give you guys a chance to look. Malachi chapter 4. Right before Matthew. For behold, the day is coming, burning like an oven, when all the arrogant and all evildoers will be stubble. The day that is coming shall set them ablaze, says the Lord of hosts, so that it will leave them neither root nor branch. But for you who fear my name, the Son of Righteousness shall rise with healing in its wings. You shall go out leaping like calves from the stall. You shall tread down the wicked. There will be ashes under the soles of your feet. On the day when I react, says the Lord of hosts. Remember the law of my servant Moses, the statutes and rules that I commanded him at Horeb for all of Israel. I'm going to give you a rough redneck interpretation. God isn't happy. You read this. The day is coming, burning like an oven. You'll be stubble. Set them ablaze. God's not pleased. Now he's speaking to the nation of Israel, his people. These are his chosen people, his kids. He's saying, I'm done. I'm tired of this. It's been, it's been thousands of years where, where, where his people would, would be worshiping him and then they'd fall into idolatry or idolatry or forget to, to invest in the temple. And God would say, man, I'm done. And so, so they'd go into slavery and then God would rescue them out and they'd say, God, we love you. Thank you. And they would repeat. And it was a circle. They would, they would fall into sin. God would rescue them and they'd say, thank you. And go around and around. After so many years, God said, I'm finished. This is it. What God is saying here is he's saying, your disobedience is showing me your unbelief. Now, when you read this passage, it doesn't say the words unbelief. It talks about disobedience. And myself included, so oftentimes we look at God and we go, yeah, but that's not how God works. We talk to God and go, God, just because, you know, I'm living immoral and I'm not really going to church. I don't give to church. I don't serve. God, that doesn't mean like I don't believe in you. You hear me right, God. We, don't, we look at God and go, God doesn't use logic. Like he just loves me because it's me, right? That's the standard we apply to God. But it's so humorous because we would never apply that standard in our own lives. A lot of people here are married today. Married, if you're, imagine wise, if, you, if your husband every night, you know, during, during the day he sends you text messages. I love you. I want to spend time with you. And he says things. You come home at nighttime and he's, he's on the Xbox all night long. Or he's at Applebee's watching the game till, till 12 at midnight. And you're like, all right, no problem. He does it night after night after night for years on end. He's, he tells you, I love you. I want to spend time with you. You're my priority, babe. But his actions never show. If there's any intelligence or logic involved, at some point the wife goes, you're a liar. That's not how this works. Or in a relationship, if the husband or wife continually steps out in the other, is sleeping with somebody else, they come home and say, I'm sorry. Please forgive me. And you go, I forgive you. They do it over and over and over for years on end. And you say, yeah, but just because just I'm not doing what, what I said I would do doesn't mean I don't love you. At some point, 
I think every person here would go, yes, it does. You said you loved me. You said you'd do this. You didn't. You lied. That's how our lives work, right? You've got a job. You tell your boss, listen, just because I know I said I'd be there on time. I said that. I know I said I'd be effective at work, but I'm not. But I love my job. Pay me. I've had a few jobs in my life. You're going to get fired. And you can't even argue because that's logic. Or students, you're in school. I love math class. I've actually never gone. Speaking of college students here, I don't go to class. I've never done homework, but I love math. Every, everybody with any logic would say they're a liar or they're just completely unintelligent. They don't understand. But when we look at God, we want to go, God, but that's, that's not how God works. God doesn't use logic. He loves me. So I'd, I tell him I'm going to do things. I, this is how I act too. God, I love you. I mean, I don't want to give to church. I don't want to serve. I'll come a couple Sundays a week, and I might read my Bible, but I mean, I believe in you, God. Not how it works. This is, what, this is God telling his own people, his children, his chosen people, I'm done. We're finished. And what God's doing here, he's going to go to 400 years of silence. No talking. Now, in these days, God actively communicated with his people. And he said, I'm done with you guys. You don't want to do what you said you would do. And we're sitting here today going, silence, what's the big deal? God didn't talk. But imagine just silence. Some of you are, are already uncomfortable. Ed Baptiste thought about texting already. He didn't, but I was watching. That's, that's how we operate, though. We get uncomfortable. God spent 400 years, said, I'm done. I'm not talking. And he knew it would cause a, a sense of desperation. But the beautiful part about God and the way he loves us, he doesn't ever leave us with no hope. Verses 5 and verse 6. Behold, I will send you Elijah, the prophet, before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. And he will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children, the hearts of the children to their fathers, lest they come and strike the land, the decree of utter destruction. God says, I'm going to be silent. I'm done with you. But believe me, I'm coming back. I'll turn. I'll restore the family unit. I'll make things right again. He gave them hope. He told them, trust me, Christmas is coming to winter. He gave them hope. But it was silent for 400 years. But he said, just trust me. Luke chapter 1, verse 5. In the days of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah of the division of Abijah. And he had a wife from the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. They were both righteous before God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and statutes of the Lord. But they had no child. So Elizabeth was barren, and they were both advanced in years. While he was serving as a priest before God, when his division was on duty, according to the custom of the priesthood, he was chosen by lot to enter the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And the whole multitude of the people were praying outside the hour of incense. Now Zechariah, he was a priest. This is his profession. This is his lineage. This is what he does. And it says he was, he was called to burn incense. This happens one time in his career. This is the ultimate climax, the Super Bowl of his career. He's reached the top. This is a big deal. And there appeared to him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And Zechariah was troubled when he saw him, and, fe and fear fell upon him. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard. And your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son. You shall call his name John. You will have joy and gladness, and many will rejo rejoice at his birth. He will be great before the Lord. He must not drink wine or strong drink. And he will be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb. And he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. And it will go before him in the spirit and the power of Elijah, to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just, to make ready for the Lord a people prepared. It's been silent for 400 years. Zechariah knows the scripture. And all of a sudden God says, God sends Gabriel 
an angel and speaks to him. Zechariah is fully aware of what's happening here. He knows the silence has been broken. God spoke. The hope is here. There's no question here. Zechariah knows. Winter is met by Christmas. I, I, I can't go deep enough to let you guys know. Zechariah is fully aware of what's happening. It's over. 400 years of misery and God says, I'm back. I want you to see this. This is amazing. 400 years ago it was written. You see this. The hearts of the father to the children and the hearts of the children to their father. 400 years later, the first time God speaks, he says the same thing. If you doubt the, if God's word is legitimate, if it's true, this, this is a very key point in all of scripture. Luke wasn't one of these priests. He wasn't a Jew. He didn't grow up in the, the Israelite church. He was a Gentile. He went and talked to people and asked questions about what was said. And through all this, he found the exact same words were used 400 years apart. This is a, a huge point in scripture. God saying 400 years ago, trust me, this is what I'm going to do. 400 years later, the first thing he says is, I told you, this is what I said I would do. God holds true to his promises. It reminds me of a story uh, of a beautiful young, la young lady in Africa. Her name is Miriam. In Tanzania, there's 50,000 albino people, the most in the world. She's there with her mother. In Tanzania, the faith of an albino is pretty, is pretty set from the time they were born. Uh, the most likely fate is they'll be blind by the age of five. The sun burns their eyes. Uh, very likely is she'll have skin cancer by the age of 10 because they don't have sunscreen in Africa. Um, she'll be covered in tumors. She'll live in pain. Uh, and it's also likely that someone will cut her arms or her legs off to sell for witchcraft. This is life in Africa. I've had times in my life when I thought it was winter. Like, man, life is rough. God, where are you? You want to talk about the worst lot in life that I, I've, I can think about. This young lady, Miriam, was born in a Muslim village called Kuala. Now, this isn't a statement on the Muslim religion. I'm simply speaking about this village. In this village, if a woman speaks out of turn, she will be beat. And it's fully acceptable. You cannot talk. So this is a woman born in a village where her voice will never be heard. To parents who have no money, where she's going to get malaria and waterborne diseases, grew up on a dirt floor. Her parents probably won't educate her because normally it's only men that get educated there. To top it all off, she's an albino, so I hope your arm doesn't get cut off for somebody's beliefs. And if you keep your arms, you're going to die of skin cancer. And the hardest part is there's no hope of the gospel. She has no hope. Her parents, her, they've been living in winter, in darkness, hopelessness. And that's all they know, just like the Israelites. The exciting part about her life is uh, our pastor, Pastor Jacob. Pastor Jacob grew up in a mud hut in a poor village, and he, made, he got his education, he moved to the city. He was the principal of a school in a brick house. But he said he felt the call on, God's, on his heart from God, that he should move back to the village and reach the people that he needed. So he took his wife and his children back to the village to live in a little hut, the village of Miriam. And they brought hope to her parents. He told her father, we're starting a farm, we'd love to employ you, so now we've got a job coming. He said, your daughter's an albino, we'll provide sunscreen and sunglasses, we'll care for her. And told him about Jesus, a hope for the future, and they started to believe. They saw a hope for the future. That's what the gospel brings. Let's move on. Verse 18, and Zechariah said to the angel, how shall I know this? For I'm an old man and my wife is advanced in years. He's doubting. And the angel answered him, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God. I was sent to speak to you and to bring you this good news. And behold, you will be silent and, un and unable to speak until the day that these things take place. Because you did not believe my words should be fulfilled in their time. And the people were waiting for Zechariah. And they were wondering at his delay in the temple. And when he came out, he was unable to speak to them. And they realized that he had seen a vision in the temple. And he kept making signs to them and, they, and remained mute. When his time of service was ended, he went to his home. Zechariah couldn't believe it was Christmas because it had been winter for so long. Zechariah knew in his head. He knew the facts. God's been silent. God spoke. He told me I was going to have a son. He was going to prepare the way for the Savior. Wow. But it had been so miserable for so long. He couldn't buy it. He couldn't, he couldn't believe it. 
this is a little bit of a buzzkill. You know, if I wrote the Bible, which is why I clearly wasn't allowed, I would write something like, Zechariah believed, he, you know, he went home, told everybody, everybody got saved. That's what makes sense. If I was writing religion, I'd want a real hoorah story to get everybody excited. But that's not what happened. It said, the angel came, spoke to the head priest, the head priest didn't believe, so God took his speech. But how often do we do this? God sends hope. We have a church, we have something that offers us counseling, something that helps us in our marriage, fill in the blank, and we go, it's been bad for so long, I don't want it. Let's go back to Miriam. The same thing happened. It was too good to be true. Her father knew he had a job coming. He heard about Jesus, daughter was cared for, but it had been winter for so long, they couldn't buy it. They moved to the city, the big capital city. Before I flew home to, you know, these couple months to visit, uh, we got a hold of them. They're living on the streets. Uh, a very dangerous place for the daughter. They have no job. She's sick. He couldn't believe there was hope. He heard it. He knew it. He just couldn't believe it. And because of his pride, he won't go back. Now his family's suffering. Those are depressing stories, but they're not, they're not all depressing. One of my favorite stories is of uh, Fatima. This is a woman in the same village who got saved. She started coming to Pastor Jacob's house late at night. She'd come when the sun's already down, so nobody would know because it's dangerous. She started hearing about this man named Jesus who loved her, who believed women were equal to men and to give them the same love, something she never experienced in her village. And she got saved. She was scared. She didn't tell her husband, but somebody else did. Husband beat her till he believed she was dead. He took their daughter and all the children and left. Pastor Jacob found out about this, and they went and rescued her. They took her to their house and, and nursed her back to health. All she had to do was say, you know what, I'm, this isn't my thing. She could have her family back, her children back, but she knew it was real. She lost her family. She'll never see her children again. But she had hope. She knew it was real. This church of new believers, all believers of less than a year, came together and bought her a half acre of land so she could provide for herself. But she's an active member in the church because she heard of the hope and she believed it. Now, if there's ever somebody that would say, this is, this is a bunch of garbage, she's the one. She came to this man named Jesus who said, I love you and I care for you, and she got beat to death. Just barely survived. But she said, but it's not about this. I have faith in the promises God gave me. And a church of new believers bought her land and built her little house to provide for her. Would we do that? Do we do that? Do we house people when they're in need? Or is it kind of inconvenient? This is why we're in Tanzania. This is why we're looking to go to Peru. There are places where the gospel's never been. There's a need far beyond what I can ever comprehend in these areas. But today, uh, all of us sitting here really have one of a number of choices, depending where you're at in life. Number one, uh, you've never experienced this hope. You're hearing hope, Christmas, winter. You don't know what's going on. You might not be a believer. This is really simple. God himself sent his only son, Jesus, to this earth. He was born a lowly life, lived a perfect life for 33 years, and willingly died on the cross, a painful death, and came back to life again to pay for your sins, to pay for mine. And he said, just believe in me, I'll give you hope. I'll give you a future, I love you. Some of you have never believed that before today. Today is the day. Later we're going to have a time to come forward and pray. Come forward. Say, I want that hope. I want to believe in what the gospel has to offer. Now some of you say you believe it, but you're, you're a little different. You go, oh, I, 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 it's not that it's too good to be true. It's that it's not good enough for you. It's that you say you're saved, you say you believe it, and I go, ah, I'd love for you to come and serve on Sunday morning. I'd love for you to give. I'd love you to go to community group and you go, ah, it's not that good. 
The gospel's not good enough for you. It's just good enough, you, I, I, I want to go to heaven. Is it good enough that I invest my life? No, then you don't understand it. The gospel is so good that you should struggle with being too good to be true. Not that it's not good enough. Jesus gave his life. So we had the, not, not the burden, but the opportunity to give to God's work. The opportunity to serve. If you're sitting here today and you believe what the Bible says, you believe it, but you don't serve. You don't disciple anybody. And you don't give. You don't understand it. That's what the gospel is all part. It's not a burden to serve. It's an opportunity to serve because God's been so good to us. I've been guilty of this in my life. We need to look at our lives and say, is that me? The gospel is not good enough for me. That's a dangerous place to be. Another group of us uh, think it's winter because we've never really experienced winter. Like I said, it's not winter outside. You think it's winter, it's not. Let me take you north. Negative 50, snow drifts over your house. You're like, wow, this is winter. But we do this in our lives as well. And again, this isn't a pitch like it's never bad here, it's always bad overseas, suck it up. That's not true. But for some of us, our lives look that way. Oh, I had to work 60 hours again this week. I'm sorry you have a job to pay your bills. A lot of you parents are thinking, I need to send my kids overseas. They think it's winter. They don't know how hard life is. The reason they see it that way is they hear their parents talking. My boss, my friends, my church. They hear their parents talking about how winter it is in their lives, and they just repeat, my school, my parents, my allowance. Some of you, parents and children, need to come together. You need to experience what it's like overseas. This summer, we're taking a trip to Tanzania and a trip to Peru. If you've been to Tanzania or Costa Rica or gone through a trip with Wells Branch, I need you to come forward and stand right here. Right here, everybody. This is a small number of the people of this church who have gone. We've sent so many people. Now the reason we send trips overseas is not to be like, you need to experience the pain of the third world country so you, ex you appreciate your life. But that is a benefit. You get to see, not even the physical difficulty, the spiritual depravity around the world. You go, man, I'm so thankful for my church and what God's given me. But number four, the, the last group that we really want to focus on is a lot of us need to take winter, we need to take Christmas to a place where it's always been winter. That is why we go overseas and take the gospel. There are places like Tanzania and Peru where the gospel's never been. Void of the gospel, no hope for a future. Here at Wells Branch, we do missions to bring hope to a place where there is none. If you're sitting here today and you've never gone on mission, you've never given to missions, you're missing an opportunity to invest in God's work. Not a burden, not a requirement, not a guilt trip, an opportunity to go and to give. About a year ago, I had a chance to... Uh, go to the islands of Lake Victoria. Uh, a mission trip went through. I knew the leader, so, so I went up with them. We rode a boat ride one night at about 10 p.m. across Lake Victoria. It's like an ocean. And got to show the Jesus film. This young girl came forward, and she, was, she came forward to accept Christ. She was maybe 13 years old and 120 pounds, uh, and she started thrashing her body. She was possessed by a demon. And, and me, myself, I've been, I've been pretty a skeptical of these stories, just being honest with you. And I'm 260 pounds, and I grabbed her right wrist. This girl was not more than 100, 120 pounds. A Division I football player who was there with me grabbed her left wrist. And we had about four local men on each leg. We couldn't hold her body down. She thrashed and bruised herself, broke her bones, bruised us. You want to know oppression? You want to know winter? This is the winter that exists overseas. This young girl at 13 was so filled with demonic presence that me and... Ten other men couldn't hold her to the ground. 
this isn't just one crazy story. This is life for these areas. These people are out in the cold. There's no hope. You wouldn't leave your family out in the cold. You don't leave your neighbors out in the cold. Don't leave them out in the cold. They need hope. We have to give to missions. We've got to go on mission. This is what we do here at Wells Branch Community Church. That's the mission today. Pray for missions. Go. Give. This is what God has called us to do. It's simple. It's basic. And everybody can do it. It's a yes or no choice. Today after service, I mean this. Come to this room. We've got, we've got lunch. We've got a documentary. You can watch a full documentary on what God's doing in Tanzania. We'll talk about what we're going to do in, in Peru next. And you're going to get a chance to ask questions and, and ask how you can be involved. This is a simple, simple opportunity. You want to be involved or you don't. Be a part of your home church and what they're doing overseas. And that will trickle back here and you'll have more of a love for your neighbors and your community. And God's kingdom will be advanced. God, thank you for today. Thank you for a church that, that loves you. Thank you for a church that loves missions. Enough to start their own thing send a young missionary couple overseas to empower local pastors to take the gospel to places it's never been. God, thank you for allowing an undeserving people, a person like me, to speak just about your heart for missions. I pray you break the heart of me even more. You break the heart of the people standing in front of me to go again. You break the heart of this church to give to missions, to go, to take hope, to take Christmas, where it's always winter, for they have to come back home and change their communities. God, we praise you and thank you for your love. We thank you for Jesus who gives us a reason.